If you're using Kubernetes, you're probably using uh, Helm or Customize or JSONnet or some other templating or overlaying tool to define and manage your Kubernetes resources. So here comes the question. Why do you do that? Why are we using those tools? Isn't it easier to just define pure YAML without templates or overlays or any of those things? Well, it's not. Pure YAML is hard to update, like changing the image or adding labels or anything like that. It is hard to refactor. Imagine that you have to change labels on all of the resources or all of the resources of certain type and so on and so forth. That would be hard if you just have a bunch of YAML files. So we're in a bit of a pickle. I do not really like templating or overlaying, but I have to use them. I would like to use pure YAML, but that's not enough. Until now. So, how do we manage definitions of Kubernetes resources? We might be using templating like Helm, and that's kind of great for third-party applications because whatever is inside of those Helm charts is not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. All I have to do is use uh, variables or put values into a chart and off I go, unless it is not well documented and I do need to go through Helm charts and so on and so forth, and then it becomes a nightmare because after all, I do not like templating. Templating is just blah. Oof. Or you might use something like customize to overlay YAMLs on top of other YAMLs. And that's kind of better for my own applications, not for third party apps, but still it's hard to assemble a full picture with customize. It's hard to know what really is because you need to take a base file and then it's overlaid with something else or it's patched with something else. It's, it's a bit of a nightmare as well. We do not have better option. So customize or Helm or JSONnet or one of those is great, but I'm not really happy with them either. I just have to use them. And by the way, if you're not familiar with Helm or Customize, take a look at this video over there. Uh, it explains the differences between the two. And then we got GitOps. And one of the four principles of GitOps is that the desired state should be declarative. So you might say, hey, that's fine. I'm using Helm, that's declarative. But really, is Helm declarative? It's not really. It's YAML overlaid or with injected uh, templates that show some values or some simple conditionals or loops or so on and so forth. So Helm is a declarative format with injected imperative uh, replacements or logic. It's not really declarative. Customize is not declarative either. It's not fully declarative or it is, maybe, I'm not sure, but you need to assemble a bunch of pieces to get one single resource, which is kind of against the logic. Ideally, I would just have YAML, and that YAML would be in Git, and then Argo CD or Flux would synchronize what is in Git with my class, and that would be great, but we are getting back to the initial problem. How do I update YAML? How do I refactor YAML? I can use sed commands or YQ, but that's also really... Mm, ah, not really great. It can easily get out of hand. So I'm back on Helm or Customize or JSONnet, but there is a solution. And that solution, potential solution, is called KPT. KPT might be just what we need if we want declarative format, and especially if we want to use GitOps and have the desired state in Git in a way that can easily be understood. So what is KPT? Well, just like customized, KPT uses transformation-based approach. It transforms things, but it optimizes for in-place configuration transformation rather than out-of-place transformation. So what does that mean? It means that you can transform your YAML, your manifests into different type of manifest, but without uh, creating a new set of files or outputting things directly to Cube API. So it allows us to modify files in place instead of 
combining things like Helm or customizing and then sending output to Kubernetes. The official description says a package-centric toolchain that enables what you see is what you get, configuration, authoring, automation, delivery experience, which simplifies this managing Kubernetes platforms and KRM-driven infrastructure at scale by manipulating declarative configuration as data separated from the code that transforms it. That was horrible. That was truly horrible official description of something because you need to be amazing or very concentrated or very good at understanding things because I didn't at the very beginning, but you're in luck. I'm going to show what that really means through a demo and then we're going to discuss KPT. It's potentially awesome. That's TLDR. So let's take a look at the uh, directory that I have over there, the base directory. It has three files, deployment, ingress service, right? Typical Kubernetes stuff, YAML, not Helm charts, not customized, just pure YAML. Now, instead of me trying to figure out examples of what I should do to show the benefits of using KPT, I'm going to execute Datri test base YAML and see what will Datri tell me, what are the potential improvements I can do on those manifests so that I can use those improvements as examples. And by the way, if you're not familiar with Datri, you should be. It's an awesome tool to do runtime validations, client-side validations of your manifests and a few other things. Check them out. They're sponsors of this video. So if you check them out, you would be helping this channel. And remember that two things, Datri is awesome. Second, uh, this is not about Datri. I'm using Datri to find the use cases I can uh, develop using KPT. So Datri told me, hey, scheme of that uh, one of those files is not correct the field spec selector is required i'm missing the selector in my deployment and i should uh, correct that so let's take a look at the manifests i have in that directory i have a service and that service does not have any labels that's bad that's probably why that complained because labels are part of matching selectors in deployments. And anyways, let's go progress further. I have ingress. Ingress is also missing labels. Ah, that's bad, bad, Victor. And then we have deployment, which also is missing labels. And those labels should be not only in metadata, but also in uh, matching labels for the template and inside of containers. So there are a couple of places where I should have labels in my deployment. And one of them is actually mandatory for matching labels so that deployment knows how to create pods. And that's what Datri was complaining. So how can I add all those things? Now I can edit those files. I can add labels to one file, multiple places, another file and a third file, or I can use KPT, which is a better option. And the first thing I'm going to do with KPT is to take a look at the three of the files that can be managed by KPT. So I'm going to execute KPT package three, and I can see that I have four files. One is KPT file, which I'm going to explain later. And I have base directory with the deployment ingress and service that I already showed displayed here. So let's take a look at how I can modify those files without using customizer helm or any of those things. And modification in KPT goes through functions. So we can execute one or more functions. So I'm going to execute KPT FN, short for function. I want to evaluate directory base and the functions are always in containers so i need to specify the image i'm going to use gcr.io kptfn and then set labels i want to use a function that allows me to set labels to my manifest and the label that i want to set is app and it should be with the value devops toolkit and that's about it it's not very descriptive it's not saying what it did but i can easily deduce that with git status. And I can see that with that single command, KPT figured out that it should modify three files because three files were modified. You can see that with git status. So let's see what it did. Let's take a look at the differences between before and after executing that command. And we can see that inside the deployment manifest, it figured out that not only it should add labels 
to metadata section, but also inside of the template, another metadata section, and in the selector as well. So it figured out that, hey, if you want labels, those are all the places where those labels should be added. And it did the same within Ingress, which is much easier, and within the service definition. So it added labels everywhere. That alone makes it so much infinitely easier than to refactor Kubernetes manifests with uh, Helm or with Customize, because with those we will still need to go through multiple files. And I'm not going to even mention how complicated it would be to add that using SED or JQ. Actually, it's not JQ, it's YQ. But there is one negative thing about this as well. It did not preserve formatting fully. It removed touch, touch, touch that I have in my manifests and uh, I like it. So it is not really preserving formatting 100%, but it did a really good job with uh, adding labels everywhere. Now let me commit those changes and see execute that tree one more time to see whether there are any other changes I should do to my manifests. So the command is that tree test and then the location of the manifest, which in this case is base directory. And we can see two things. First of all, that tree is not complaining anymore about the selectors. So that's fixed. But now it is saying, hey, the default namespace, <clears throat> you shouldn't be using the default namespace. And it's right. You, nobody should ever use default namespace for many different reasons. So let's see how we can fix that, how we can use KPT to add namespace to all the files that we have. And we can do that with a similar command. We can say, hey, KPT, I want to execute a function that will evaluate something. And the function is in a container image called set namespace. Unlike before, this time I want to define the namespace in all my manifests, and that namespace should be a team. So let's do git diff again to see what did KPT do this time. And we can see that now it did not add stuff to my manifest, it modified. So it figured out, hey, there is already a namespace. I should not add a namespace, I should modify the namespace so that it's not default, but a team. And it did that in all three manifests. Now, one thing you will notice about the previous command compared to the first one, the first one I executed with KPT, is that this time I did not uh, define the image as GCR IOKPT dash FN and then the name of the function or the name of the container image because GCR IO is the default, it's assumed by default, and I do not need a fully specified path to the image. Now let me commit those changes as well and execute that tree one more time. So that tree test base asterisk.yaml and take a look. Yeah, there we go. There are no more changes required. To my manifest. I'm fine. And I proved that with that tree. By the way, if you're not familiar with that tree, I made a video. Check it out. It's in the description and over here as well. Now there is alternative way to manage your manifest with uh, KPT. One is, as you saw, to execute the command with all the parameters, or we can specify things in KPT file. So let's take a look at the KPT file. And now there is a lot of boilerplate over there, API version kind, metadata, info, and so on and so forth. What does matter is pipeline. Pipeline in this case has mutators and validators. Mutator is saying, hey, I want to set labels and the labels should be app defined as DevOps toolkit and the type as silly. And I want you to validate my manifests after and before you apply the mutations to double check that everything is fine. Now, validators are not really great. Uh, use that tree for that. Use that tree to validate your manifest, but mutators are actually pretty, pretty amazing. And this file shows in an easier way the distinction between data and uh, manifest themselves, and it will be applied directly on files and not by sending it to Cube API. So how can I apply this mutator and that validator? The command is kpt fn function render. And then it will go through the mutations and everything defined in kpt file. And we can see that it is running one of them. It passed. It is running the second one. It passed. And now it should have applied uh, all those labels, two labels, to my manifests. 
So let's take a look at git diff and see whether it really did that. And we can see that it didn't apply those two labels because one was already in the manifest. It figured out, hey, there is no need for me to do anything about the app label, but I should add the label type everywhere. Three places in the deployment, one place in the service and another one in the ingress manifest. Now you might or might not have KPT file. It's not mandatory. It's your choice to see whether you want to use it or no. Actually, you might be forced to use it, but uh, just as a boilerplate something. So if KPT file is not present, KPT CLI will create it and use it to keep track of the upstream repo. And we are going to see why it's doing that in a moment. But before we do, let me add and commit those changes. Now, there are two ways we can approach uh, what I'm going to do next. And what I'm going to do next is to apply those manifests to my Kubernetes cluster. I could just execute kubectl apply and it would apply those manifests because kpt modified manifests themselves. Or I can use kpt live in it and then I would initialize kpt or the kpt file to start tracking what's happening in my cluster. So let's take a look at what happened to kpt file now that we initialize it. Two things, actually. First of all, it did not preserve formatting. I like my stuff indented in one way, kpt likes it in another. I do not like when somebody or something is messing up with my formatting unless there is an error that must be fixed. But okay, let's forget about formatting. What does matter is that it added the section inventory stating, hey, the namespace is a team, the name is this one. That's the name that it will use to track those resources. And the ID inventory ID is a long hash uh, that doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that that's how KPT tracks what's in a file and what's in a cluster. So if we want to apply it for real after initializing, we can execute KPT live apply and then optionally reconcile period timeout uh, in this case to 15 minutes and then we wait for a second and while we're waiting you should subscribe and like this video and do all the things that you do when you reach this far in a video because you liked it right okay back to my screen it's finished kpt applied my manifests and I can confirm that by executing kubectl, the namespace is a team. I want to retrieve everything and the ingresses as well. And we can see that there is a pod and a service and deployment and replica set and ingress. Everything is there. KPT did more or less the same thing as kubectl apply. But from now on, it is tracking what's in a file and what is in a cluster. And we can see that really happening by outputting the definition of a resource in a cluster. Let's say kubectl namespace is a team, and then we want to retrieve the deployment, the host toolkit, and output it as YAML. And if we scroll up, 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 we can see that there is a new annotation. That annotation was added by KPT that says, hey, the owner of the inventory is B4F7, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's the same identifier that is in the KPT file. So KPT knows how to track stuff and how to interact with the cluster and so on and so forth. Now you might be wondering, hey, how do I know which functions to use and when to use them and so on and so forth? And the answer is relatively simple. If you go to the documentation over there, there is functions catalog and it's divided into two sections, curated and contributions. And curated is actually where you will spend most of your time unless you start creating your own functions, which you should. And over here, we can see that there is apply replacements, apply setters and so on and so forth. There are quite a few functions. I mean, not a huge number of functions, but enough to get you going. Those commonly used functions are there and you just need to check the documentation and see which function you should use and how. We can go to contributed functions and there are only two. So let's ignore that for now. Now there is more. Uh, KPT aims to be GitOps friendly, to integrate with GitOps tools. And it does that with config sync, which at this moment is not really supported in neither Argo nor Flux nor Rancher Fleet. It works out of the box or not really out of the box, but works with Antos and Google Cloud Platform, uh, or to be more precise, Antos on GCP. That might come one day, but don't have your hopes high that you will be able to apply KPT files with Argo CD or Flux or any of the GitOps tools. That's not happening right now. I do not know when and if, but that should not really matter because 
you can use KPT in a way that you modify files directly and then you just apply them with QCuttle or Argo CD. You do not need, really need a KPT file to do what you need to do. You can modify your files in place. Now let's uh, come up with a more complicated example. Let's say that I would like to modify image in my manifest and that I would like to do that at the same time as I'm modifying the namespace and that I want to have a copy of those files stored somewhere else. How would I do that? Now, the answer is simple. Uh, KPT follows the Linux best practices that every command is uh, an output that can be used as an input of the next command. So I can do something like, hey, KPT function should use source based. Base directory should be the source for the function and then that should be output to KPT function eval that will change my image and uh, then it should be output. The output of that should go to another KPT function eval that will change my namespace and then I will sync that into a new directory called prod. So take the files that's the first command and then evaluate them by changing the image and then change the namespace and store all that in a separate directory called prod. Now this is absolutely amazing. Trust me, it worked, right? It modified the image and uh, the tag of the image and it, it did it in the same way as customers would do it and it modified the namespaces and namespace actually in singular and then it stored it in a directory but that directory cannot exist. So you cannot use that command to sync into a directory that already has manifests. It needs to be, uh, the directory cannot exist, which is a bit silly. It's a downside because I can imagine myself having some base uh, files and then uh, copying, uh, syncing those files into one directory or another for production or staging or something like that, but it's not meant to be. And we can see that that's what really happened by executing kpt package 3 and uh, you can see on the screen now we have kpt file just as before the base directory just as before and the prod directory with a different manifest for deployment ingress and service and if you still don't believe me let's output the deployment from the prod directory and you can see over there that the image was modified the tag is now 505 and the namespace was modified as well. Now it says prod. There's one more thing I want to show with kpt. I mean, there are other things, but one more important thing, and that's the command kpt package get and then git directory, git repository actually, with a directory and specific version that I want to get. So I can use kpt in a similar way. I would use Helm charts. I can fetch the packages from somewhere else, in this case, from a git repository, and that can be based on a tag, on a branch, on commit sha, or basically anything that Git supports. And now if I go to the WordPress directory, the, because I downloaded WordPress as an example, and output kpt file, I can see all the mutations and all the stuff that somebody thought I might want to use or do with uh, WordPress. Now let's talk about kpt pros and cons. Should you use it, should you not use it, and so on and so forth. To begin with, KPT is so much more, or to be more precise, it wants to be so much more than what I showed, but it is also a young project where so much more is in very early stages. Personally, I think that the main value is in the functions themselves, being able to modify easily our manifest and maybe, just maybe, use pure YAML instead of customize or Helm because it modifies YAML, right? It's much better option than SED or JQ, or again, not JQ, YQ. So what are the, what should I start with? Let's say downsides. What are the cons of using KPT? To begin with, it works only with Docker and Podman container runtimes, which is a pity because I personally prefer NerdCuttle and I also like running stuff inside of pipelines that are running in Kubernetes and I cannot run Docker in Kubernetes I could run Podman, but that would be a separate story. So I don't really like that KPT is tied 
to Docker and Podman and cannot work just with any container runtime as it should. I do not like that it regenerates manifests instead of modifying them in situ. And that means that you might lose a bit of formatting and the things that KPT does not really understand, which is also a pity because I like my stuff being formatted a certain way. What else? Oh yeah, I mean that part of KPT that you can download the package with KPT, which is similar in a way uh, to how we use Helm charts is not really great for a simple reason, because there is no abundance of uh, KPT packages as we have with Helm charts. So if you want to use uh, third party apps, you will not find many with KPT. And even those that you find are not really well managed by somebody else, by third party. It could be tentative to use it as a package management uh, for your own applications, but not for third party. Next, uh, there is nothing that would allow me to maintain some kind of differences between environments for my manifest, something there like uh, customized overlays. So I'm probably going to combine KPT with customize, but then that defies the purpose of KPT. So it's a bit tricky that it cannot uh, be more customized like without really using overlays. And I just realized while I'm saying that, that that's a bit uh, contradictory. So uh, let's scratch that as uh, it does not matter. Finally, it does not support GitOps tools at least not yet, but that should be okay because with KPT, you can just modify YAML files and push them as they are directly to Git. So there is not necessarily the need to have integration with GitOps tools unless you're defining your mutations inside KPT file instead of executing them yourself or through pipelines. Now let's go to positive part of this section, the pros. To begin with, documentation is amazing. I'm Truly, truly, truly surprised how good docs are, considering that this is a relatively young project. I think that the first release was a year ago or something like that. In-place transformation is great. I think that that's where we should be going instead of overlaying and templating and stuff like that. It is much more GitOps friendly. It is much easier to deduce what somebody wants instead of going through a bunch of different files and trying to assemble it like puzzle. So I like really the idea of in-place transformation. It is very easy to do refactoring. And lastly, it is very easy to create custom functions. So you can supply KPT with uh, your own container image that will do whichever transformation you want it to do. All in all, I think that KPT might be one day, not necessarily today, but one day might be a missing piece for GitOps. It might allow us to apply GitOps processes with truly completely 100% uh, declarative files. That would be absolutely awesome. The main thing that is stopping me from using KPT myself on a daily basis is that it doesn't support NerdCuttle. It works only with Docker. And I like Rancher Desktop. I'm not using Docker. I'm using Rancher Desktop with NerdCuttle. So it's me, right? If you are using Docker Desktop, uh, Docker itself, or if you are using Podman, that this is a great tool, absolutely great tool. Try it out, you'll love it.